Hello, and welcome to Loyola Marymount University. My name is Dennis Draper, and I'm the Dean of the College of Business Administration. Each year, we are fortunate to bring in a number of prominent business executives and special guest speakers to participate in our CBA lecture series. From high-ranking government officials, to leading journalists, to internationally acclaimed social entrepreneurs, all of our distinguished speakers share one common goal, to educate our students and local community on some of the biggest issues in global business today, all while reinforcing LMU's underlying mission of teaching business with ethics and social responsibility. Thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoy the presentation. Good evening. Welcome to Paul A. Grosh Lecture Series, Fall Semester 2016. I want to thank uh, um, Nancy Donovan, one his, her students that helped set up this event. Uh, I'm delighted to uh, have uh, Ruth McCartney to, tonight here as our speaker. Uh, Ruth uh, is uh, an entrepreneur, has uh, experience in music business, marketing, uh, web development, social media, uh, PR, and big data. She'll be speaking in those areas tonight for us today. Uh, she co-founded uh, the uh, Ruth McCartney uh, Multimedia Inc. with her husband, uh, Martin. Uh, Nether God is here, who is the president of the company. Ruth uh, plays the CEO uh, of the company. Uh, uh, Dr. Angie uh, McCartney also here. She is the controller of the company. <laughs> Ruth uh, co-founded also iFans.com, uh, a management software company for uh, for fan management. She is the president of Connect Code, a quick response technology and marketing software company. Uh, she has been. Uh, well-known uh, speaker internationally on these topics and most recently on the topic of big data. Let me welcome uh, Ruth McCartney. Aha! There's you Ruth see? Is it by magic? Thank you so much. Technical glitches are always a, a sign of a good thing. You know, people say break a leg, they actually mean it. So <laughs> Now all I need is my clicker. Ah, there it is. You see? Everybody needs a clicker. So, um, thank you so much. My name is Ruth McCartney. I'm here on behalf of uh, the Business College of Business Administration of LMU and Dr. Mahmoud, whom we met in Salt Lake City, which is another story, a few years ago. And this is not one of these lectures where I'm going to say to you, oh, everybody switch off your cell phones, because my husband and... Uh, co-conspirator Martin Nethercutt, who's here this evening, who helped me put this speech together. We actually put some little interactive bits together, so if you want to pull that up um, on your phones, we'll get to that as we go along. So we are here to talk about big data and its impact on not only all of us, but accounting students and, you know, everybody in the world who walks around and eats and sleeps and drinks, and where's one of these silly things? Um, but these are one of the things that you'll see when you go on your smartphone. This is a Norscorp map of the real live data attacks that are happening on the United States and China and Europe and whatever all the time. So this is why we really need to be aware of not only security, but also, you know, what we're doing with it in the accountant. So obviously big data is the topic and that's why I'm here. The very first um, part of the big data <laughs> collection, I would say, was uh, Emperor Quirinius, who uh, <laughs> the irony of this was that it started in Syria, which those poor people now, they don't even have you know, bricks and mortar and running water. But uh, it started in between 2008 and 2016 years ago. And um, the Emperor Quirinius, Emperor Augustus, I'm sorry, um, asked everybody to come and create the world's first census. And so, you know, Mary and Jesus of Nazareth came and they, um, uh, 
Mary and Joseph. Gosh, you can tell it's a long time since I've been to confession. Bad girl. Um, came and they, you know, they were engaged and they engaged in the census. And this is this is actually a, a historical um, rendering of them uh, registering in the census. So that then gave way to our typical church records, all of the things, the church birth, marriage, death, the census data, all of the things that we knew then in the old days, everywhere you went, you know, if you were born, married, died, and all those things that Ancestry.com lives on today, those were all part of the original data collection, and it started 2,000 years ago, and possibly even before. And future, in the, in the, in the middle of the speech, we'll get to the point where the amount of data collected in the last 2,000 years and the amount of data collected in the last 24 months will hopefully blow your mind. Um, then we, of course, we moved on to drop your business card to win, which was, you know, a lead generation thing, a marketing deal, sign up for our direct mail, um, join an enthusiast or fan club, and that is kind of what leads me to why I understand a little bit about fan clubs in those days. Um, when I was a kid, my mother, Angie, Dr. Angie, who's sitting in the front row, married Paul McCartney's father. So I just, all of a sudden, I woke up one day and my brother was a new brother. And he had these friends, John Lennon and Ringo and George Harrison. And um, they had this little business called, a band called The Beatles. And um, so that's us fishing in Wales when I was seven, and I, I said to Paul, quick, paparazzi, take my beer. Uh, <laughs> actually, no, it wasn't, it wasn't my beer. I'd already drunk my beer. That was his beer. <laughs> but, um, and then on the filming of Help in the Bahamas and, you know, at home in Liverpool. So I grew up around these four lads that were really working class kids. You know, they came from nothing. They came from nowhere. It was post-war Liverpool. Nobody was thinking about fan clubs or business or data or what have you. But John Lennon, who used to come and stay at our house in Liverpool because he, he'd moved away from Liverpool very early on when his mum, Julia, died, um, he always used to refer to the fans as customers. He never ever called them fans. And they would sit around and they would say, oh, what are we going to, you know, John would say, how are we going to organize the customers? If we only knew who they were, we could actually communicate with them and that would tell us where to go and play and what songs they'd like to hear and what we should be recording. And so, you know, those were the days when relevance was easy. Now, a lot of you students are probably going, well, uh, who's Paul McCartney? What? Yeah. He's the old guy on the left with uh, Rihanna and Kanye. So, <laughs> um, back to the original story, the uh, nice but who are all these people, we used to literally get sacks and sacks of mail and baskets full of mail to our house every day. And miraculously, in those days, the post office actually worked. There's a concept. Um, tracking number, what's that? We don't, tracking number? We didn't give you that tracking number. Well, you did, it's right here. No, never mind, your text dolls at work. So this was how we, Ange and I, and my auntie Frida Kelly, managed the old fan data. So things would come in the mail and they would literally come case by case, sack by sack. And things that we would get would be like, Dearest Paul, George, and Ringo, please tell me where you'll be every day for the next 10 years. I want to plan my schedule always. Mona D, Cedar Rapids, Iowa. So what I learned at a very early age was that American people were trained to write letters without an address on the letterhead they would always put their return address on the back of the envelope. So again, at six or seven years old, earning 10 shillings a week, poor little slave labor child that I was, saving up for a bike, still can't ride one. Um, I learned that, oh, if a, if a letter came in from America with an American stamp on it, you took it apart and you got the stapler and you stapled the letter to the envelope because that's the only way you were ever going to be able to trace the data and get it to marry together. And so we started a 
five by seven index card. Somebody at dinner asked me, well, what was it in those days? What, what kind of PCs did you have? No, we had pencils and paper and Roneo machines and little shoe boxes that we used to collect from Clark's the shoe shop and put the cards in it. So that's um, really how we started. But then that's how everybody started. And we started with data that was name, address, city, state, and zip. So all of that data in those days, it was great. It fitted very neatly into an org chart, in structured data tables, in data trees and columns and rows and cells. And you could actually fit it in a spreadsheet or what we now then came to know as an ACT database or a gold mine or a FileMaker Pro. But you know, debits to the left and credits to the right, as we know. It was a nice, uh, how many accounting students are in here? OK, so I, I, do I have that right? Is it debits to the left and credits to the right? Or is it the other way around, and that's why I'm broke? <laughs> <laughs> don't know. Okay, maybe it is the other way around. Yeah, it's one, one of our family's left-handed, but hey. So, and I eat meat, so I'm the right-handed one. Uh, in the old days, then, you could you know, create an account online. So then came like 1997, 1998. And you could create an account, enter your information, and create a password. That still fit really into the very easy database, spreadsheet, cells, and columns situation. But then along came this thing called Amazon. If you like this, you might like that. Oh, now we've got if, else. Now we've got and, or. And as you know, databases like zeros and ones, and yeses or nos, or left or right. But then we had things like Yelp. What did you think? And there's a whole bunch of freeform data being put in there. Um, send it to a friend. Well, who's your friend and what do they like? So that was the very beginning that we now know as big data. But in 1998, when my husband and I invented iFans.com to manage fan data, we were all just madly filling in stuff. And nowadays, it's called UGC, User Generated Content. There were no acronyms for these things. There was no way to record it. It's like, honestly, to this day, if you call any 800 number and praise or complain American Airlines or Hilton or Chipotle or whatever it is you want to say, there is still no way, apart from one way that I'm learning about in England, to verify and quantify all of that data. Audio, video, voice, GPS. So we created with Yelp and with um, Amazon, we created kind of a chaos with this thing called the internet. Then there was you know, post to social media. So we, here we have structured data. So we've established that small data fits in nice little buckets, and it's column A and cell B and this, that, and the other. But then we get into unstructured data, and it comes with social media and its likes and shares and dislikes and comments. And now we've got various shades of gray in between the zero, the one, the yes, the no, the black and the white. So now we've created shades of gray and shades of the rainbow and all of this stuff. And we've got sensor data, so uploaded videos, images, footsteps, all of these things. And so these new data types became known, as we now know, as big data. Ta-da! So there's the big data slide. <clears throat> so if you think about the old ways of doing it, the information superhighway that we know, that we knew, before most of you were born, was that nice straight road with the roof down and Fleetwood Mac plane, and we were going to Key Largo, and it was just a two-lane highway, and there were no lefts and no rights. Now, we're back stuck on Lombard Street in San Francisco with just a bunch of traffic going, uh, where's everyone going? I mean, at least Lombard Street's a one-way street, but that is kind of how I visualize old data versus new data and, you know, small versus big. So here's an interesting example. So in America, we have, for the most part, except for back east, uh, Philadelphia and those people, and, you know, they support the Cubs, so who knows about that. But uh, go Dodgers. Um, they, we have a, a grid system, so if I know that zero, or ocean, starts at the ocean, and I count back in towards, away from the ocean, in towards east, first, second, third, fourth street, and I'm meeting you in downtown Santa Monica, I say I'll meet you at the corner of Santa Monica and fourth. So, all right, well, I kind of looked that up, and I 
oh, I'm driving up fifth, and the ocean's over there, so I know I have to make a left because fourth has to be that way. So in America, the streets have names, and the blocks in between them don't have any names. We don't name our blocks, so we can get in a Lyft or an Uber, and we can say, go to you know 7th and Wilshire, and the cab driver will logically know where that is. Well, now imagine you standing on any street in Tokyo, and um, you say to a Japanese person, what's the name of this street? And they go, huh? The streets have no name. Well, do you need to know the number of the block you're standing outside? Because in Japan, the blocks are the spaces in between the streets, and they are named in the streets, don't have names. So the, it's kind of, to me, the difference between our old way of thinking of data and the new way of thinking of data. So imagine you're a taxi driver in, in Tokyo. You have to know the Shimbuya district, and you have to know, OK, well, that's block 10, this is block 11, and that's block 13, and that's block 16. So I'm logically looking at this as a map as a Western person going, well, uh, how come they're not like east to west or north to south named? Oh, well, that's the same number as the house system. And you say, well, OK, what do you mean? Well, I live in block 10, house 1. Great. Well, why isn't house 2 and house 3 next door to that? Oh, well, they're named in the order for which they were built. <laughs> so. Again, the idea, and, and this, is, this is a piece uh, taken from my dear friend Derek Sievers, who started CD Baby, and his TED talk uh, on the larger part of the subject is credited in that link that I gave you at the beginning of the speech. But again, we think about streets have names and the blocks don't count. The Japanese think about the blocks and the house numbers in the order in which they were built count, and the streets don't even have a name. So it's the difference between small data and big data as we used to think of it. And I think that's, a, you know, that's the way I like to, to look at it. So where does all this stuff go? Well, it's this magic thing called the cloud. Mm, OK, well, what is that? And how much is it? And what does it, what does it actually capture? So it's every Skype call, every SMS, every phone call, every music download, every Netflix stream, all of those things that you and I literally tacitly put into our lives are going in the cloud, whether you like it or not. Um, I know most of us say we have nothing to hide, but no, nah, it's nah, kind of not the point, and I'll get to that in a little bit. So the exponential growth, so more than 90% of the data in the world was created in the last two years. So if you think about the last 2,400 years, we got to X, okay? In the last 24 months, we've got to x times 2. So 2,500 years times 24 months is we have doubled the amount of data that we are creating as human beings. I mean, I, I know. When I made that slide, it was like, whoa. Is that ser uh, no, it's seriously right. But that data is also from you know, the Internet of Things. It's not just all of us walking around. It's us using our mobiles and our phones and calling into 800 numbers. We're cutting billions in energy costs, so that's a good thing. You know, we're using smart light bulbs. We are decoding DNA to find cures to predict diseases. We are anticipating hurricanes. I mean, the, think about the Weather Channel. You know, I, I almost hate to say it, but I'm going to say it. I don't, no, I don't know. I don't have my check yet. <laughs> but I'm going to say it anyway. If Hitler had had the Weather Channel, he probably wouldn't have gone to Russia. Just saying. <laughs> You know, <laughs> just putting that out there. But <laughs> I heard John Burns laughing. In the 2000 presidential, 2012 presidential um, election, that was the first time that we were able to use prediction, predictional analytics. And Nate Silver predicted correctly all 50 states in the Electoral College based on all the kind of exit polls in that data. And this is why John King on CNN, whether you agree or disagree, he blows my mind. I mean, he stands there and does stuff like this. It's like, they can't pay that guy enough. It's crazy. He knows all of the Electoral College votes, all of the data, all of that stuff. And those things are being collected by Facebook likes, by hashtags on Twitter, they used to just be exit polls or early voting, but now we can literally be predictive in elections 
based on the data that we're all putting into social media. And I, I really want to, I honestly thought there were going to be like, you know, nine people here tonight because of what's on television on CNN right now. And I'm really, really tempted to make a, you know, political joke. I won't. But I'm so glad that I'm not at home watching Jerry Springer run the debate. <laughs> so there it was. That's my one and only political joke. Um, so what is the size of this information? So we're all, fa you know, we're all familiar with gigabytes, right? So you have an 8 gig or a 16 gig or a 32 gig phone. So a gigabyte is, you know, a billion bytes. A zettabyte is where we are now. So we've gone from gigabytes to squigabytes to petabytes. So when we first started giving this speech two years ago, Martin and I wrote this thing originally two years ago, a petabyte was literally as far as you could go. We are now at zettabytes, which it, it just literally in 18 months kind of, you know, it makes me crazy. But by 2020, a digital knowledge, the global digital knowledge, is supposed to equal 44 zettabytes. We're at 4.4 today. So in four years, the exponential growth of that data, which we all give to the cloud, and we give to the man, and we give to the corporations by walking around, and duh, we're in a Fitbit, and all of these things. That's what's going to be extrapolated. And you, as young accountants and number people, need to think about how do you farm that data? How do you make it your business to be important in the boardroom? So a gigabyte on an old iPod is 960 minutes of music. We're now measuring things in zettabytes. That's two billion minutes of music. 960 minutes, two billion minutes. And those are the, those are the things that we're now talking about doing. So, you know, we're drowning in it, but only half a percent has been looked at. Only one half of one percent of all the data collected in the world has been looked at. So, that's a good thing. That should make you feel comfortable that nobody knows where you got four double espressos today. They might, but they probably don't. Only Howard Schultz cares, right? So, it's, it's truly amazing that all of this data is being collected, but how do you farm it? How do you make money out of it? And that, for you guys as accounting professors and generation, the next generation of accountants that are going to go out there, think about what your .com is, what your app is. How are you going to make a difference in the data that's collected and morally and correctly, and how is that extrapolated into doing good for your boss, doing good for the world, and really sort of making good out of data that could otherwise be used for bad. So it might seem big brother, it might seem creepy, but there are also some good and interesting things happen with this data. So the World Health Organization back in 2014, they were uh, tracking tweets and, you know, different little hashtags and things like that. And five days before Harvard actually, be before the World Health Organization, um, actually realized there was an Ebola outbreak, the Harvard Health map went, uh-oh, we've got doctors and people with mobile phones all over the African continent, and we're seeing this hashtag, Ebola, Ebola, Ebola. So weeks before, and then literally almost a whole week before, the World Health Organization, the Harvard Big Data Health Map, got hold of this thing, and they went, this thing called Ebola is a problem. There's an outbreak, you know, it's, <laughs> it's going to be a big deal. And today, they're doing the same thing with Zika. And not only are they doing it uh, with real-time data, but they're also predicting where the Egypti uh, mosquito is going to go based on weather patterns and humidity and storms and, you know, typhoons and hurricanes and this, that, the other. So there is a really great side. To, to big data. And of course, to how many of you guys have like a, um, a grocery card or a loyalty card or a Ralph's or this, that, the other? Great, okay, good. As long as you're not buying naughty stuff with it, you're good to go. Um, there was a well-publicized uh, trip and fall case a few years ago in California. And there was a man shopping at one of our local grocery stores who shall be nameless. And uh, he sued. The, the store after falling in one of the aisles. So 
they subpoenaed his stuff and they looked at his shopping uh, history and it included large amounts of alcohol at 6 o'clock in the morning and equally large amounts of alcohol at 4.30 in the afternoon and the same amount of alcohol at about 10 o'clock in the evening. So they were, um, you know, they accessed it by subpoena and guess what? Mr. Slip and Fall didn't win against the grocery chain. So all that stuff is being tracked and... I'm not saying it's out there, but if there is a, co a court case or something against you or something you're trying to prove, then absolutely it can be done. There was another case in Nashville, Tennessee, where a gentleman lost his uh, the custody of his children in a divorce battle because they subpoenaed his grocery card. Again, proving that the guy was, you know, either he was buying beer for a construction crew <laughs> or he should have been calling Lyft, you know. This is a really interesting story, and uh, Target. So, you know, Target has, again, their credit card, and they reward you for buying certain things. But Target and a few of the other big stores, like Walmart and Kohl's, or whatever, they're really, really good at predictive marketing, let's just say. So um, they can tell when somebody's in the first trimester of a pregnancy. So there was a guy in Colorado whose daughter had gone away to summer camp, and she was she was young, I don't know, 17, 16, something like that. And he kept getting all of these offer cards saying, oh, folic acid and pampers and olive oil and all of these things. And he was like, who is this for? So he marched down to the local Target and he said to the manager, why are you sending these things to my daughter? And they said, oh, because she's pregnant. <laughs> and I was like, no, no, no. She's at six, she's 16, she's away at summer camp in, in Wyoming or somewhere. And they're like, oh, okay, my mistake. Daughter comes home. Dad, I need to talk to you. <laughs> sure enough, Target knew the daughter was pregnant before the family knew. And because she'd been using her Target card to buy things that sent a signal to Target's data center that she was going to come home in this fashion. Um, hmm? Here's a head shaker. Does anybody know what these three um, images have in common or, or correlate to? Nope, good. Okay, fine. Ha <laughs> I win a dollar. I thought I was going to, I bet a dollar against myself that seven people were going to go, I know this one. Um, so that is Joplin, Missouri. That is one of Walmart's several secret data centers. The um, city planners and the mayor of the several centers that they have built have to sign, had to sign secrecy agreements on the building permits for these buildings. That's a hurricane. And when Walmart's data center detects through big data a hurricane is coming, it ships three times the normal amount of strawberry Pop-Tarts to its distribution center because that's what people buy before hurricanes. <laughs> British Airways uses it for a much more, you know, f dainty thing. So British Airways, if you join their frequent flyer program and you book a seat, they know if you like an aisle seat for a short hop or you know, window seat for a long hop, but they've taken it one step further and I actually kind of like this because you don't get sitting next to the nerd who collects poodles and, you know, crochets sweaters. They've actually made it optional that you can, in your profile on BritishAirways.com, you can put in things you like, things you hate, what you're listening to on your iPod, um, not just the usual vegetarian meal, I'd like an aisle seat, but they've actually made it possible that to seat you next to people on a long-haul flight that you might possibly get along with, thus increasing the brand value that you had whilst you were aboard British Airways, which I think is actually pretty smart. Food service. Here's another great example. So if you're a young, if you're a local restaurant like Truxton's or Tompkins Square or something like that, and you think, ah, you know, I might put a mushroom, portobello mushroom pizza on the menu. Is that going to work? This co particular company, Food Genius, lets you plug all of the, your ideas in. It searches incredible amounts of databases from food service like Cisco 
um, stores like Ralph's and Bristol, Mar Bristol Farms, and also the local median price of the farmers markets to say, well, you should be paying this for chanterelles and that for portobello, and it's going to cost you an average of X per slice plus labor and whatever to create uh, a mushroom pizza. And you could probably in your zip code sell it for that. Do you want to put it on the menu, yes or no? So there's no more guessing, and this is something like 20 bucks a month for a local restaurant to join Food Genius. There's no more guessing, oh, I think we'll put that in the specials menu, wonder if that'll work. Because we've all gone on Facebook and Snapchat and Twitter and gone, I like this, I ate that, I went there three times and this, that and the other. So Food Genius pulls from all of those things and tells restaurant operators what may or may not work at such a price um, per deal. Agriculture, you know, we're, we're living in, <laughs> hello, will it rain? Should I do a rain dance? Would it please rain in California? Um, but through drones and new big data technology, we're now able in um, various states, and including California, to predict which crops to sow and when and what to, uh, you know, what to optimize in real time. So... Retail foot traffic, this is an interesting one. So here's a store up in San Francisco um, that's using um, Prism Skylabs. And they have a heat map on the floor. So they have little copper wires under the floor. And you know those little eye in the sky things that you see when you go into security cameras? So those two things are now coming together. And the manager's office upstairs, or what have you, can see where the hottest foot traffic is in the store. So if the jeans are not moving, they simply wheel over, you know, the jeans to the hot area of the store. So you'll see a lot more retail, especially fashion stores, putting their displays on casters and on wheels and so on and so forth, because they can literally tell in real time from the heat map between the security cameras measuring the heat of people's heads and the copper wires in the floors, <laughs> you wonder why they're redoing all the supermarkets. Hmm? So this is, uh, this is what they're doing in retail. Um, so what does, all this, what does all this do? I mean, it's all collecting this data and that's when size matters. So we had, you know, our debits to the left and credits to the right. We had our little doggy here and now we've got this giant thing called big data. So uh, Apache Hadoop is probably, I would say, the leader in the space and all of these companies from Amazon and Netflix and eBay and Facebook, 20th Century Fox, they're, they're all using Hadoop. There are more, there's Bulk, there's Hulk, there's, there's, you know, there's a whole bunch of them coming out that are based on MySQL, PHP, but they're all open source and that would, the great part about that is, is that young developers can log in uh, or latch on to Apache Hadoop and say, okay, you know, I work for Gap or I work for a small local business. I'm going to create my own framework based on the data that we can collect from our social media and what we need to know. So, but Hadoop is kind of the, you know, the big boy of the, of the block. So what Hadoop does is it takes all of this spaghetti-sized, like crazy data that we have now, which is, you know, unstructured data, and it turns it back into uncooked, nice, straight spaghetti strips. So that's, Apache is really way ahead of the game on that. How many of you use um, Lyft or Uber or any of those? Yay. Do you ever wonder why search pricing? No, oh, it's busy, 1.3 times, no, no, no. Okay, well, this is how they get it. They go to Google Maps, they go to Waze, they have APIs that are all hooked in, in real time, through Uber and through Lyft and into their driver's cars and into their Androids and into their iPhones, and it just literally automatically tells the whole app, the whole system, the whole back end, again, through big data, we're at 1.2 times the pricing, or we're at double the pricing. I mean, we all know the, hello, it's New Year's Eve, you're gonna pay double the price. But this is how they do it in real time. So here's an interesting case study. There's a Coles up the street. I don't know how many of you have been there, but have you seen the electronic price tags on all of the stuff? Yes, hello? Hmm? This is all controlled by a company called Altier, and they have a, five-year battery life 
on these little price tags. And as things are picked up and put down, it measures something. As things are taken out of the box and then the barcode is scanned at the checkout, it reorders an inventory and it might put the price up by a dollar. So if you want to guarantee that that fantastic pair of boots that you want for Christmas goes up in price, go into Coles on Sepulveda, pick them up and put them down 17 times. Um, Walmart, again, who we talked about with the strawberry pop-tots, whatever, they have got something called Polaris, which is um, a semantic intel system. So as you go through the Walmart app or the website, eh, depending on how many milliseconds you spend on the page, or if you put something in your shopping cart, or the I'm interested list, or I might like it, or I hate it, or you share it on Facebook, all of that semantic data is being collected. and the items that they push and they sell and they market vi versus the poor little vendors that they never reorder from, that means up to a 15% increase in, in, Vol in Walmart's volume of, of uh, revenue. I mean, I don't even want to calculate the number <laughs> that is 15% of Walmart, but it's more than I made yesterday. That's for dang sure. Um, in the fast food world, here's another case study, here's interesting. There are fast food chains now that have cameras out, so isn't he lovely? Wouldn't you love to buy a burger from him? <laughs> yeah, please, I, I hope he licks my yogurt before he gives it to me. <laughs> <laughs> but there are fast food chains that are now uh, testing cameras in the drive-thru and, you know, the, the traffic deal. So they know how many people are in the queue and their digital sign says, oh, well, we can make these fast and sell more of these and serve more customers. But if there aren't that many people in the queue, the menu changes and things that take longer to cook and serve, well, there you go, that's what's on the menu. So the menu literally changes depending upon the demand and depending on the traffic. So, Morton's, this is a good one. So there's a guy on a plane and he used to go to Morton, Chicago and big fan and he was at the Newark airport and he's stuck on a plane and he's getting off the plane, he's getting on another plane and he starts tweeting and using a hashtag. And he's like, oh God, yeah, I wish I could get off the plane and get a Morton's, yeah. So Morton's social media team found this, saw this, figured out who the customer was by his hashtag, what he likes to order, where he was, what flight he was probably connecting to based on his home address in the Morton's database, cooked up the order and sent somebody out to the New York airport to deliver him a meal. I mean, talk about, you know, customer service. But without big data, again, this wouldn't all be possible. Now imagine you're a young accountant and you work for Morton's. You need to be talking to, in a conversation with the social media department. You need to be having the interaction with IS and IT and what I'm trying to be a proponent of is you guys live, the, the students who are in here, you live on mobile, you live on your cell phones, you live on all these things. So you understand, I'm, not, I'm preaching to the choir, you actually don't need me. But what the whole industry I think could use is that the chief marketing officers and the CEOs and the presidents need to realize that there is a new generation of accountants coming up that can be valuable in these predictive accounting conversations. So you, you know what it is, you know what you're doing. Um, predictive policing. Here's another example in the, in the crime world. So Predpol is a company that the LAPD, for one, um, in Santa Cruz in California, they're working with, and it, it's actually funny, they, the algorithm started with predicting earthquakes. And then they went, well, if you can predict earthquakes, you can predict eh, almost anything. And so they tweaked it a little bit, and so they've literally come up with the predictive policing that the LAPD is using, and there's been a 33% reduction in burglaries in our city, in LA, because of the power of big data. Um, Tesco, which is a bit of a home thing for me, but they're using, it's a, it's a grocery store in England, they're using it for data points to analyze refrigerators. Well, I mean, how crusty and boring is that? Come on, please. But if it keeps the price of my frozen fish and chips down, 
hey, I'm all for it. So they took all of this data and they keep better tabs on, you know, leakage and electricity usage and so on and so forth. So it literally is all over the place. But back to the Morton's example, the monitoring and the mentions and the likes, that's just my screen of my Hootsuite that I took literally this morning before I came out. Um, that's, you know, some of the accounts that we, we manage. And you can see, you know, the tweets, the schedules, the timelines, the mentions, the this, that, and the other. So I'm using all of this data through something called Hootsuite, which is only 10 bucks a month. And there's Falcon and there's Sprinkler and there are all these incredible companies that you guys can go work for that literally take all of this social data. Um, but I use that literally every hour on my phone. I have the app. And I look and go, okay, who's mentioning this brand? My mother's wine brand or tea brand or my husband's music or the clients that we manage. So, you know, monitoring, mentions, likes, all of that, that feeds into just my little world. I'm able to look at all of this big data for literally 10 bucks a month and react in real time to the social media part of it. So we all live in Hollywood. So I, I got some questions before we came here. I was like, okay, so, so how, are we, how are we contributing to Hollywood if we're not in the film school at LMU, if we're not an actor, what have you? Um, every time you put something in your Netflix queue or you watch it on Amazon, of course, it's, you know, it's being measured. It's part of a metric. Um, and the interesting thing here is how many of you guys are fans of House of Cards? Bunch. So House of Cards would never have come to be in the United States if it had not been for the House of Cards British series. So it's an old, old, old English political series. And there were ideas afoot at Netflix and the wonderful Ted Sarandos team over there. And they're like, what can we get that's kind of intrinsically British but make it American? How can we... You know, who's America's kind of favorite crazy actor that could be a president? So they put all of that data stuff into their system. And they came up with Kevin Spacey. And they said, well, who's kind of an off-the-wall director that people like binge watch and they have you know, evenings of this director? And the Netflix bot came back and said, David Fincher. And then they went, okay, so you know, politically speaking, uh, what's a great series that's done so well for 20 years overseas? And, you know, and the Netflix bot came back and said, House of Cards. And so, ladies and gentlemen, bingo, I literally give you the very first Netflix original hit. And they, honest to God, they took that from the data that we had all given them over the years. So talk about predictive accounting, predictive Hollywood. The Star Meter by IMDb. So um, IMDb, the Internet Movie Database, was started by a little nerdy guy called Kevin in a village in Cornwall in England several years ago. Oh, probably 25 years ago. And he started taking little yellow pad notes and he was like, ooh, I like that film. I like that actor. I'll give him two stars. I'll give him four stars. And he made his own kind of thing. And then in 1998, when FileMaker Pro, like I said, came online in the database world, um, he said, oh, I'm going to make this thing called imdb.com. Didn't mean anything. He paid $5 for the domain name, and bingo, all of a sudden, it belongs to Amazon. And now, if you subscribe to IMDb Pro, which all of the casting agents do, all of the directors, all of the producers, all of the studios, everyone in Hollywood, and it's hundreds of dollars per month per person, this is what you get. The users vote through their actions. So Haley Bennett is the number one star in Hollywood this week. So if I'm Haley Bennett's agent, I'm going, whoa, I can ask for five million more than Evan Rachel Wood to star in a movie. And we, through UGC, through user-generated content, we are literally voting for the people that we want to see cast in movies. And their agents are beginning to catch on, and the studios are beginning to catch on. And that's why Amazon paid. <laughs> billion dollars, I'm not allowed to tell you the number, for IMDb. So your click does count. Moneyball, did anyone see Moneyball? Yep. Well then, you know, hello, That's, you get the point, right? So, you know, they were an underperforming baseball team and they caught on to the fact that, huh, 
Maybe there's something here with the data. And so, you know, I don't need to tell you the story. If you saw Moneyball, you get it. And of course, then they have this giant star, Brad Pitt, starring in Moneyball, so which compounds one and the other, and then that big data story tells itself. And then there's the audio side of things. So their music business is in deep, deep trouble, as we all know. But we, with our little tiny iFans, we only have 6.4 million um, members, but our subscribers, our bands, are able to upload MP3s to our system, albeit giving them away for free, but we can tell them in real time, pins in a map throughout the world, how many people in which exact IP address are listening to which song and what should be the single. And I'm gonna, sh I'm gonna share something with you now. That screenshot was taken in 1998. <sighs> We, t we, we literally, that's how I'm so passionate about big data. We did that in, before a lot of y'all were walking or out of diapers, right? So that is what we were able to extrapolate from Google Maps, an IP address, and our server in 1998. Imagine what they're able to do now. Kind of frightening. So this brings up the question of privacy. These guys, right? and many more like them. So your privacy is our policy. That's what it says everywhere, but is it? That's the big question. So, you know, one's living in the Ecuadorian embassy and the other one's living in Russia. Boo hoo. Um, privacy is a big deal. It's a big deal for Westerners. It's a big deal for America. And so is the First Amendment. So the question is, what price privacy? You know, we, we give away all of this stuff. But you have to remember, even though it's tacit, nothing online that you put online ever, ever gets deleted. It's like a tattoo. You can have it rubbed out, but it's kind of still there. So, you know, here's the argument that Snowden was trying to make, whether you agree or disagree with him. The argument that he was trying to make is telling all of us what's really going on. And you get what you pay for. So if you have a free email account, a Google or Yahoo or Gmail or you know, Hotmail, whatever it is, they have to find a way to be able to operate and make money and shove data offshore because storing data costs a lot of money, right? So if Google says, uh, I'm going to have to, s oh my gosh, you're sending this many files. Uh, I can't store it in my servers. I'm going to shove it off to somewhere cheap like Iceland or Hong Kong or whatever. The minute that your email server sends something off the American shores, it is no longer protected by the Privacy Act. And that is when PRISM can grab it. And when it comes back on shore, all bets are off. They can examine it, they can see where it went, where it came from, who it went, who it was copied to, and all of that stuff. That's what Snowden was trying to tell us. Unfortunately, he didn't really have his escape plan very well. I'm thinking Venezuela, fruity umbrella drink, bit of a beach, Moscow, eh, not so much. Um, and the Google LO app, there's, see, there's another one. It was launched literally four weeks ago. It's like WhatsApp, it's like Messenger. Um, and they seem really convenient. These things seem great. You know, oh, you text your friend, but this is all created forever and it lives in the cloud. And if somebody gets a subpoena and they need to check you out for a criminal reason or even a pilot's license or security clearance or a job at the Aerospace Corporation or Hughes Aircraft or any of those, they can literally go back in all of your stuff. And the LO app, which was launched very recently, will store all that stuff, and it gets deleted from your account, but if they're, for seven years, if any of these companies get a subpoena, they have to turn over all of your accounts, including Snapchat, including all of that. Have you, uh, do any of you have Facebook Messenger? Have you ever tried to log out of it? You can't. You, you just can't. I, Tried to do it again this afternoon to prove myself wrong. All right, Facebook Messenger, da, 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 log out. And just you get this cute little message that says, you are unable, yeah, uh, it is not possible to log out of Facebook Messenger. Okay. All righty then. So hmm, I'll just yell at y'all. <laughs> uh, Weedless Monday. 
Here's an interesting thing. Right down here in the wonderful Playa Vista, which is a great place, and we love to go to all those places, it was uh, Martin's and my anniversary. So we went and we had lunch and a stroll around, and Martin said, oh, wonder if they have espresso anywhere other than Starbucks for a change. So we went to Sol Cucina. We literally, we walked in. I said, oh, no, they don't have an espresso machine. Okay, thanks for having us. See you later, bye, whatever. We walked out. That was at 1.10 p.m. At 1.12 p.m., I got this email. Thanks so much for coming in. I didn't log on to their Wi-Fi. I didn't sign up for anything. Didn't use a credit card. Didn't buy anything. Nothing. So, just saying. If you're having a little something-something on the side, don't go to Sol Cucina. <laughs> Unless it's like refried beans and rice on the side with your burrito, then that's okay. <laughs> so HIPAA, now here's another whole thing, right? So the, the Health Privacy Act. What, is, what are the pros and cons? So, you know, I keep telling you, I'm wearing one of these crazy Vivo fit things. Um, you have the privacy thing, and that's, that's your life and your body and whatever, but it hasn't been adjudicated yet. So what if you work for like a giant logistics company and you're wearing a you know ugly uniform and delivering boxes in a truck or you're flying for an airline or what have you and your boss says hey you know here's a free fitness band and please tie it to your iPhone and your corporate email account who owns that data it doesn't that doesn't exist yet in American law it hasn't been adjudicated who knows about how many steps you take, how many calories you burn, your blood pressure, how many hours you're sleeping, how many hours you're not sleeping. If you accept a fitness band from an employer, you need to think about registering that with some kind of fake Gmail account. <laughs> or even maybe your own. Because if you have a health insurance policy um, through something that something is tied to, you really might want to just mm, get a fake Hotmail account. Because the really the jury is out. Nobody knows who owns that data just yet. So every time you take a step or a calorie or you input all of that information on those type of screens, you really need to think about where is that going, who owns it, and is that for the good of the bad? Passwords. Okay, this is the boring bit. Really, really boring. I know the rest of it was kind of boring, but this is the really, really boring bit. So. You know, use a level A password for your email account. So, like Smith Street 42, the street you were born on and the number. A B password would be something like your middle name, your spouse's middle name, and a date and a number and so on. Axel Ann, whatever. So, a C level password would have a, spe a special character like, you know, dolphins with the magic dollar sign for the S13. But then by combining all those passwords that you regularly use on a, on a daily basis, those kind of things, who, I mean, who's going to guess that? SS4AA10D$1. But you need to have something that you, you keep in your brain because the more you change your password, again, the more that gets recorded and over and over and over. And all those passwords go somewhere. So if you can keep something in your head that you just know and you don't have to go forgot password and put another password in the cloud, that would be a good thing. So um, do you have your phones on that magic URL that I had when I came in, bit.ly slash LMU big data? You take your phones out, you'll see a much more interesting screen than this one. If you click on the uh, live, live internet data stats, this thing is just marching on, and that will, discover, that will show you literally how fast we're all just giving away free information to the cloud. And I, I don't want to come off as some kind of, you know, <gasps> they're tracking us, pessimist. It's, it's all good, it's fine, as long as you're okay with it, and as long as you know that, you know. And as long as you, as young accounting students, realize the value that you have in your brains knowing this, because maybe the class before you that graduated last year, maybe they had some inkling of this, and maybe, they, maybe they're on it, and maybe they know it. But you're really the first generation that is going to go into the job marketplace and go, 
I got this. I know about this. I can do predictive accounting. I can do all of that stuff. I know about the Internet of Things. I mean, there are four billion connected people through devices. That's more than half the planet. The seven billion of us, four billion of us, four trillion revenue opportunity per year. Four trillion dollars from the data that's collected. And remember what I said before? 0.5% of it is being monetized and scrutinized and scraped and collected. 95.5% of all of that data that we're giving them in the cloud is not even being looked at. The 0.5% represents $4 trillion a year to big corporations, and they're going to need somebody to account for that and make sense of that, and that's you guys. So, what, you know, people say, what is the Internet of Things? Well, when you get out of bed, you've got an alarm clock that, you know, remote programs, custom tones, you, you make your coffee on time, all the way through your commute, your workplace, the VoIP phone, the printer that automatically orders its own ink, um, the television that you can one-click ordering, hey, I, I want to buy a movie from Spectrum or, you know, whatever. Um, RFID, all of those things, literally from home, to bed, to the commute, to the workplace, back to the commute, to home, to bed. These are things that we're all interacting with now. And they are made by Samsung and Intel and Ford and all of these huge corporations that as you kids grow up and leave college and get jobs, you need to make them make sense of the data that they're collecting and make more money for their shareholders. And, you know, big props to LMU where you came from and learned all of this, right? So. The future for today's students is that with the power of all of this massive data, you know, you're going to have to look at the books, not just at the end of the cycle, but at the beginning of the cycle. And, you know, you literally have in your hands the, the control of tomorrow's finances and Wall Street and the NASDAQ and all of that because it's going to come from user behavior and user-generated data and predictive accounting. And so... You know, here's one of my favorite, the, the old way of doing it. You know, I did the analysis using your bad assumptions. <laughs> then I applied your flawed logic and arrived at your predetermined answer. Shall I begin disillusioning the team? This needs a pie chart. Well, <laughs> there are no more pie charts, kids. This is the future is yours. This is just the very tip of the iceberg, the beginning. I'm an old fart. Look, I'm 56, and my understanding of all of the possibilities that they're collecting from my iPhone, my wrist, my Netflix, what I like and what I don't. This is just literally the very beginning and you're at the beginning of a new gold rush and as far as I'm concerned, a new gold mine and at LMU in the, in, in the School of Business and School of Accounting, you are just in a great life, in a great place. But please, don't think that posting pictures like this is ever going to go away. My favorite one is the guy on the right. Imagine waking up with like Sharpie all over your gum. You know, it's just no good, is it? So as you are students and you're having fun and you're doing all that great stuff, that's great. But remember, it is a tattoo. If it's on Vine or Twitter or you know, any of those things, you can delete it. But, you know, future employees can, uh, employers, they have huge departments of people that go and look for this stuff. So you remember these guys that I talked about in the beginning, trying to sort through little postcards and all that crap? There was a guy called Mark Zuckerberg that wasn't even born when Ringo bought his first drum kit. And now Mark Zuckerberg and co, and the founders of Twitter, and all of those guys know more about the Beatles and their fans, those 42 million people, including Angie McCartney likes this. Um, they know more about those people because of we're posting cat pictures or we're part of a baseball team or this, that, and the other. Who would have thought if I'm my stepbrother, if I'm Paul McCartney and I'm 22 years old and I'm schlepping my base on my back, landing in America, going to play Shea Stadium in the Ed Sullivan Show, that one day, fast forward... My little sister, who was four at the time, would be standing giving a lecture telling people like you of the future that there is a digital platform. 
hello, what's that? That lives in the cloud, what the hell is that? That has deep, deep data information on 42 million of my fans. Pretty incredible to think that literally I've only grown, you know, three and a half feet and two feet wide, but um, thank you for having me. Thank you for listening and thank you for showing up on this great, on this debate night and I really appreciate it and thank you to Dr. Mahmoud.